This gentleman had dealings with Benwick abroad during the late 1930s and will now introduce himself. My name is uh, Neville Harper and um, I'm son of the, the original owner of the pits and uh, we started work there just before the war, 38-9, and all loading and unloading was done by hand. We dug the material out down to water level and gradually expanded in that, that, in that way. And uh, from, from uh, about uh, maybe a dozen lorry loads a day, it gradually built up, built up, built up when the war came along till there was hundreds of loads going out every day. Chiefly to the um, RAF stations, airfields being built, such as Ella, Parham, Framingham, and all those. Neville, apart from uh, supplying through the air ministry, all supplied for other things as well. Tell us about that. The pits were started originally to supply the building trade. This was just before the war. Once the war started, demand grew for this ballast for making defences, pillboxes and all that sort of thing and um, all in connection with the repelling any invasion. Now to get all this gravel out of these pits in that area you had to have special equipment to do this and what did you start with? The early days it was all done by hand, hand loaded onto the lorries and uh, we dug out down to water level. There we had to finish. But when the war started, the demand grew. We started with dragline excavators, which enabled us to go down probably 20, 30 foot deep below water level. And uh, that's, that's how we carried on right the way through the war. And how many uh, excavators did you have? As many as seven at one time. Seven. And lorries? Yes. All oh, those hundreds of lorries. They weren't? Couldn't possibly count them all. They weren't just your lorries, you were contracted oh, no, no. other lorries from we, different areas. We hired every available tip of lorry in the area to work for us. And how many how many tons or cubic yards of the material would you have said came out of there? At the peak, I would think probably two, three thousand cubic yards in a day. And how, how, what would be the cost of a yard of uh, material in those days? Seven shillings and sixpence. <laughs> of which the estate were paid a shilling a cubic yard royalty because the land all belonged to the Banneker estate. When the workings were finished, how were they left? Just come away and left them as they were. We did nothing, got all the gear out and uh, then it was when I got called up for the army. So what the actual finish was I don't know. And getting these lorries to the um, workings, did they have a very good road? No, no, it, it was not much better than a cart track at the beginning. And uh, when we got so busy, we were wearing the roads up so quick, the Air Ministry asked us to lay off work for two weekends while they made a new concrete road which is probably the best part of a mile. This they did in two weekends, in concrete. Whereabouts were the pits, gravel pits, in relation to the sea? The area 
where we stand now um, was probably about a quarter of a mile beyond. We couldn't see the sea from where we were because in between us and the sea there were large sand dunes and uh, which were heavily mined so we never really got to seeing what's the other side. Never. to conclude with this, it means to say that Harper's Transport and your pop, your dad, administered all this lot on behalf of the Air Ministry and of Benica Estates. Am I right in thinking that? That's correct, yes. Yes. Yes, we were controlled really by the estate and by the Air Ministry. And we couldn't do much without their approval whatever it was. The estate was receiving quite a lot of money in revenues and uh, so they were quite happy. The Air Ministry were getting all the ballast they wanted so they were happy and we were just working ourselves to death. <laughs>